So there was a man named Benjamin Day, who I call the first of the attention merchants, the founder of the New York Sun, who was in his own way a business genius and an innovator. He had this idea, which was as opposed to selling a newspaper for six cents, which was uh, the normal way of doing it, uh, he would sell his newspaper for a penny and try and attract an enormous audience and resell that audience to advertisers. So the newspapers at the time, the six penny papers, they were a little bit boring. They covered politics and finance. They didn't have crime stories, that kind of thing. And he introduced a sort of far more interesting newspaper. The very first issue was all about the suicide of a man who'd been separated from his lover. Um, it had stories of death, mayhem, destruction, gossip, and was sold at such a low price that he managed to attract these enormous audiences, which then were resold to advertisers. Now the thing about that penny price is it was a money-losing proposition. Unless he sold enough and unless he reached enough advertisers to make it worth it. So he pioneered this unusual business model, which today uh, is found in as many places as Google, Facebook, Instagram, you know, it's sort of taken over our lives. So we are in a period where there's something of a revolt going on against advertising. There are a lot of people who consider themselves immune to ads or, or try and avoid all advertisers. Advertising, there's cord cutters, and there's a lot of people who use ad blocking technologies to try and have themselves sort of in an ad free zone. And, you know, it's reached the point where it's a little bit of a a kind of a, a war, maybe a war of attrition. Now I'll say two things about that. First, in the history of advertising, there have been similar moments. It seems that about every 30 years or so there's a kind of revolt, uh, usually because things have gone too far in one way or another. And I think in some ways things have gone too far on the web, that there is just too much, too intrusive, too much privacy invasion and people are starting to say, you know, this is not what I bargained for. You know, we, we've, whatever deal we had, I think you're exceeding the terms. I think that hopefully it'll lead to a place where we strike some kind of new deal, um, some kind of understanding is made. Uh, you know, the web lacks any kind of limits as to where advertising should or shouldn't go. It's not like newspapers or something where there's, you know, you don't have every page of the newspaper completely covered in ads. There's kind of a, a bargain, and I hope we reach that on, on the web. Uh, another thing that it will probably lead to, however, is also more and more efforts to use advertising that is surreptitious, that gets under the radar, that you don't really realize is advertising. You might even call it uh, manipulation or nudges. I think you'll see this particularly with uh, some of our devices or, or new technologies. Let's say you use Google Maps. Um, trying to find something, a place to eat, how much of that decision is based on you know, what's nearby and the best, how much it is based on who has paid uh, Google to sort of put the ad there. I think as we move into an era where we increasingly rely on intelligent intermediaries to find things for us or to be our guides in life, the possibilities of surreptitious marketing increase. And I think that's a direction that we'll probably see, particularly with so much resistance to advertising. You know, I think as a culture we've become obsessed with free stuff almost, uh, frankly, quite to our, our detriment. Um, you know, it's almost impossible for many people to consider using anything on the web that isn't free. Somehow it's like a, an outrage if you have to pay for it. And there's been a cost to that. I think that when many people signed up for you know, Facebook in, in the early days, it just seemed fun and free. There was very few advertising, but slowly, or very little advertising, but slowly we've come to understand that you're paying in very different ways. You're paying with your data, which you hand over. You're paying with your attention. You know, if you spend, I don't know how many minutes or, or, or even hours a day on Facebook, you're giving over something of tremendous value. And ultimately, there's several ways in which we're paying. First of all, we are granting unprecedented levels of access to ourselves, to our portal of judgment, uh, which ultimately has commercial influence or can influence our life in other ways. So we may, without realizing it, end up living lives that are a little different than we might have wanted to, buying more things than we expected to, voting for people we might not have thought we would, all these uh, sorts of things. Uh, we make ourselves open to influence, let's just put it that way. And the other cost is that ad-supported 
mediums have a constant need to deliver a receptive audience. And since we are the audience, we are increasingly programmed to be more receptive, which means uh, open to distraction, ready to be, uh, see something, constantly clicking and looking. There's an effect uh, that I call the casino effect, which I think comes to describe our lives on the web, where you sit down to write an email, and then suddenly you notice four hours have gone by. You're not quite sure what happened. You do know you clicked on a bunch of stuff, and you went here, and you went there, and I think that is kind of becoming our lives, and that's a very attractive mental state for advertisers because you're constantly clicking, constantly refreshing, constantly seeing new stuff. Whether it's good for us is an entirely different question. Um, and so I think we're at risk of losing some of our ability to deeply focus, you know, to get work done, to have the kind of attention span you need to do more profound kinds of work. And uh, that, I think, is some of the costs of free. So one of the inspirations for this book was the philosopher William James, uh, who was one of the first psychologists um, writing in the 19th century. And he uh, had this one line that really struck me, where he said, uh, roughly, you know, your life experience is what you choose to direct your attention to. And so, you know, at the end of your days, when it's all said and done, what your life was will be the culmination of what you paid attention to. Um, you know, and that, that's in some very profound way true. And it does suggest something interesting about our times. We live in a time where our life experience, moment to moment, is more intermediated than any other time in human history. It's almost like we live in a built environment of attention. Uh, most, I don't know exactly how you count the hours, but many of our hours are screen as opposed to physical. I mean, the screen is physical, but it's some uh, virtual thing. And in some sense, we live in a, a cocoon, almost a projection uh, at this point. Uh, you know, we're still here, but we, um, in terms of what our attention is paid to, a lot of it is not here. And so I, I think that um, whether that's good or bad, I'll leave to one side. But it certainly makes it important that we understand the motives of those who are creating the cocoon that you're living in. If we are living in kind of a simulated reality, if that's where we are. Virtual reality is just the stronger version of it. You better pretty profoundly trust who's creating your reality for you and maybe have some say in, 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 in what that reality looks like. And I worry that part of the reason I wrote this book is to examine those motivations. And if it is fundamentally the motivation to gather you up for resale to something, well, that might not actually be in your interest or, you know, sort of subtly manipulate you in different ways. But even more profoundly than being sold to, which, you know, is kind of uh, annoying, there is this issue of living your own life, making decisions which are yours. And I don't care if you listen to the founders or, or John Stuart Mill, the, or if you're a religious person, but the importance of decisions that are truly ours um, is so fundamental, so profound to a, a realized life that I think we need, in this day and age, where so much that we're exposed to is uh, motivated by other uh, ideas, we need to be very careful about reserving time and space for ourselves and making decisions which we can truly call our own in order to live a life that you can truly call your own. Mm -hmm.